in Chicago this week. Um, as you know, we had a beautiful wedding on Friday. Peter and Mary Albright. Wow, it was so beautiful. And there were so many tall and beautiful people <laughs> whom I had no idea who they are. <laughs> and they had a chance to hear the gospel and to have fellowship with God's people and to see a God's blessing on his children's wedding. So I'm so thankful to God for that. And then yesterday we had in the morning the CBF Easter worship. Wow, it was so beautiful. Uh, God blessed Shepherd Tim's message. Uh, I learned that through video games you can communicate with children <laughs> and uh, share the gospel message with them. It was really a very beautiful, heart-moving message. Um, also, all the children uh, really did their best and performed in many ways. Uh, Shepherd Steve's sons, uh, the small ones, had on suits and ties. You know, they're just three years old and four years old, and they had on suits and ties, and all the children dressed up and did their best and offered their programs to Jesus. And the Spirit of God was working so mightily in children's hearts. If you had heard their Bible memorization and their presentations, wow, it's amazing. I wanted to ask a couple of them to come and speak today at our worship service. <laughs> they really delivered wonderful testimonies and recitals. It was beautiful. And this afternoon, we have an orchestra concert. Right, Elder Jim? Yes. yes. Three o'clock. Here. So we're just going to stay here all together until three o'clock. <laughs> Amen. Well, in the midst of all these wonderful things God is doing, in this moment, we want to think about Jesus' words in Luke's gospel and really listen to what Jesus has to say to us today. The title of my message is, Jesus Welcomes and Speaks About the Kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and goodness. Thank you for your power of resurrection, for the victory you have given us over sin and death and the devil, and the glorious hope we have in Christ, and the privilege of living as your children and serving your work as witnesses. Please clothe us with your grace. Help us listen to your voice. Speak to our hearts. Help us know what you would have us do. Guide us, strengthen us, and help us. Enable me to share your word with your grace and spirit. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our key verse today is verse 11b. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. May we read this verse together, please? He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. As we know, the main theme of Luke's gospel is that Jesus is the Savior King, and he came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is our Savior, and he is also our King. Kings have power and authority to rule over their people. Worldly kings use their power and authority to force their subjects into submission but not Jesus. King Jesus uses his power and authority to forgive sins, drive out demons, heal the sick, and even raise the dead. 
in this way. Jesus restores the kingdom of God. Up to this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus had revealed God's kingdom through his words and through his deeds. What did his disciples do? They hung around Jesus. They watched him. They were amazed at what he did. They said, wow, that was great, Jesus. But they didn't do much. And Jesus didn't push them to do something. But in today's passage, we come to a turning point. Jesus begins to train his disciples as kingdom workers. Jesus didn't want his disciples to be mere fans. Jesus fans. Go, Jesus, go! You know, fans cheer when things go well and complain when they lose. And they're generally not very committed. But Jesus' disciples should be different. He wanted them to commit themselves to kingdom work and grow to be like him. So he sent them out to do what he had been doing, to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he also helped them to serve many needy people. This is the way they could grow. Jesus wants us to grow as his disciples. Let's learn how to be disciples of Jesus, not just fans, but kingdom workers. First, Jesus empowered his disciples and sent them out. After choosing his 12 disciples in chapter 6, Jesus first taught them what kind of people they should be. For example, love your enemies. And then throughout his Galilean ministry, Jesus showed them his person and his work. He exemplified the character and lifestyle of a kingdom worker. And now, he sends them out to do practical ministry as training. You know, Jesus could have trained his disciples in many ways. He could have treated them like contestants on the Survivor Show. Just dump them somewhere and see how you survive. Or he could have lectured them in a classroom and given final exams. Or he could have made them obey many detailed instructions, rebuking them sharply like professors of medical students. But his training was not like this. It was dynamic and very generous. He called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over evil spirits. Here we see that kingdom work is a spiritual battle against demons. The power of Satan. No one can succeed in this battle by human strength or wisdom. They needed Jesus' power and authority. St. Paul said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Even though it's invisible, Satan's power works. It blinds people's minds. It raises opposition against Christ. And it's real to be effective in kingdom work. 
requires Jesus' power and authority. Power means energy or strength. And authority means the right to exercise it. We need power and authority from Jesus. Jesus is very willing to give it to us. He tells us he'll pour out the Holy Spirit when we ask. He'll equip us with the word of God when we ask. When we're equipped by Jesus, we're ready to engage in spiritual battle and carry out kingdom work. In verse 2, we find Jesus' main purpose in sending out his disciples. What did they do? He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. To do what? Yes, and to heal the sick. The word proclaim means to publicly announce the king's message as a herald. Jesus, our king, has come to save us from sin and death and rule over us with love and peace and joy and justice. Jesus himself proclaimed this message of the kingdom of God. It is the restoration of God's reign. In the beginning, when God reigned over creation, it was very good. Wow, it's beautiful and wonderful. But through Adam's fall, man lost the kingdom of God. Man exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images of created things. Man became an idol worshiper in bondage to Satan. And this is not just a theory, it's a reality. So many people are miserable, not because of an unfavorable condition, but because they don't have God in their heart. Instead, there's an idol of some kind. And this is why they're fearful and insecure and anxious and enslaved to all kinds of desires. But Jesus came to rescue us from bondage and restore the kingdom of God. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. When Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God, it was the king sharing his message. But in contrast, the disciples were heralds of King Jesus. They should boldly represent the king, but humbly acknowledge they are servants. St. Paul grasped this and said, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for his sake. In verses 3 through 5, Jesus gives specific instructions to his disciples. Later, after his arrest, he will cancel some of them. So as we look at them, we need to grasp the principles underlying them and not just the instruction. The principle is timeless and always applicable. I want to mention two. First, to depend on God alone. What is first? <laughs> Verse 3 says, take nothing for the journey. No staff, 
no bag, no bread, no money. Uh, today he would say no credit card, no debit card, no extra shirt. Wow. When going on a journey, we need to think about taking many things. You don't want to wear the same shirt for three weeks. People are not going to like you very much. And it's easy to think about, well, what should I pack? What do I need? How am I going to survive this trip? But Jesus said, take nothing for the journey. Jesus wants his disciples to depend on God alone. Not on their own plans, their own way of survival, but on God alone. And he promises, God will provide everything you need. Mainly through those who accept the message. So when they are welcomed, they should stay in one place and serve there until they leave that town. A second principle is to keep a clear identity as kingdom workers. As verse 5 tells us, Jesus anticipated rejection. It is inherent in kingdom work. So he prepared his disciples to handle it. They should not fight with human wisdom or argue, nor should they take it personally and blame themselves, thinking, oh, if only I had spoken more eloquently. Instead, they should regard it as a rejection of the king. And King Jesus will deal with the unresponsive. In this way, they could keep a clear identity as kingdom workers. In these instructions, we see that in training his disciples, Jesus was not short-sighted. He did not demand performance to meet his standards. Rather, he was more concerned that they understand the nature of kingdom work and mature as workers based on his principles. Verses 6 through 9 tell us how the disciples responded and what the outcome was. They simply obeyed Jesus. Jesus said, go out and proclaim the kingdom of God. They went out and proclaimed the kingdom of God. They went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. God worked mightily through their obedience, and the outcome was amazing. Some people were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Others said, oh, Elijah appeared. And others, one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. You know, in Israel, prophets were great. God used them to revive the nation. People of the time felt our nation is reviving. It was just fieldwork training. Just going out in obedience to Jesus' word. But it shook the whole region. What about in Herod's palace? He was scared to death because he beheaded John. And now people are saying, John has come back to life. And in the palace, the news is going around. John the Baptist raised life. Ah! He's frightened. He represents the power of this dark world. And this power was shaken to the core by Jesus' power through his disciples. We pray for spiritual revival in our time, right? 
Do you pray for this? How can we experience such a revival? When we simply obey Jesus' word, he clothes me with power and authority and sends me out to proclaim the kingdom. And when we believe this and go out, God works mightily. And we can see all the demons in the whole Chicago region driven into Lake Michigan. We can hear on WGN, missionaries are being raised instead of all kinds of violence. This is how Jesus wants to shake our nation, our city. He did it through 12 young disciples. And he can do it through us. Second, Jesus welcomed and fed a crowd through his disciples. When the apostles returned, they were very excited. And they reported to Jesus what they had done. Jesus, you know, this really terrible guy came. He had long hair, really all full of tattoos and crazy dancing. And he was yelling at me and screaming at me. And I said, in the name of Jesus, come out. And the demon came out. He cut his hair. He put on a tie. He looked so handsome. They're reporting what Jesus had done through them. Very excited. Reporting helped them remember in their hearts what Jesus had done. Reporting confirms God's work in our hearts. And it was a time of spiritual discovery and learning from others. We can find a healthy cycle here. Be in fellowship with Jesus and other disciples. Go out and proclaim the kingdom. Return to the fellowship and report what God has done. We see the same cycle in St. Paul's missionary journeys. Practicing this healthy cycle helps us to live vibrant lives as Jesus' disciples. But if we leave out one of these elements, it can be detrimental. If our fellowship with Jesus and his people is weak, we can become worldly. And if we neglect to go out and proclaim the kingdom, we become ineffective, even irrelevant. And if we fail to report what God has done, we miss the chance to learn from others and lose accountability in the fellowship. But when we have a healthy mix of fellowship, witnessing, and reporting, we can grow continually and be a blessing in our Christian fellowship and in the world. And our lives will be dynamic and meaningful and very fruitful. It's good to examine how am I doing in this cycle? What am I doing most? What do I need to do more of? Jesus knew that his disciples were very tired. Wow, they worked hard driving out demons, and they got so excited. They thought, they're Superman. They don't need to sleep anymore. They don't need to eat anymore. They work very hard. But the reality is they needed some rest. So Jesus took them with him by themselves, and they made a plan to go to Bethsaida, withdrew to Bethsaida, you know, the word withdraw implies retreat, draw back. Did you know Jesus went on a retreat with his disciples? It's right here in the Bible. 
a time of retreat and restoration after hard work. We might call this R&R. Jesus allows us R&R, but not too much. Not all the time. From time to time, after hard work. Well, to the disciples, it was a very special time. They could be alone with Jesus. No crowd to bother them. I think they planned a barbecue uh, with bulgogi and steaks. And they planned a softball game and, and especially nap time. And they're looking forward to this retreat in a quiet place. The problem is they didn't realize how successful their journey was. You know, people who had experienced the kingdom of God were looking for them. Hey, where is Peter? He gave such a great message. Where is he? John. John? Where's John? Bartholomew? Bartholomew, where are you? They're calling out. And they discovered pretty quickly that the disciples went on a retreat. Ah, we found out where they are. So you know what they did? They went to the retreat place ahead of Jesus and his disciples. And they were waiting there. Oh, Jesus, we're so glad you came. Well, the disciples probably felt a little bit sorry Oh, man, there goes our R&R. But what did Jesus do? Verse 11b tells us, let's read this verse together, please. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Jesus welcomed them. Welcome. Wow. What a beautiful word. Welcome. I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad you came. I really want to be with you. I want to have time with you. I want to help you. Well, we see this word welcome uh, kind of all over the place. In many cities, at the entry point, in many languages, they will say, welcome. But the motive of welcoming people is to make money from them. Jesus had no such motive. When he welcomed people, it was not to get something from them. It was to give himself to them to minister to their needs, to love them, and provide whatever it was they needed. You know, this crowd was really a desperate crowd. Many kind of needy people. They all had pressing issues, desperate for help. And anyone else felt burdened by them. When they came, People would go the other way. I don't want to take your burden. You burden me. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus welcomed them. He really wanted to be with them. He didn't judge them. He didn't have prejudice toward them. He didn't say, hey, why do you only come when you need something? He didn't say, why are you coming again with the same problem? I just solved that problem last week. Here you are again. He welcomed them without prejudice or judgment, with an open heart and great love and compassion. Jesus said, whoever comes to me 
I will never drive away. You know, they interrupted Jesus' plan for a retreat, but he was not reluctant at all. He welcomed them with joy, genuinely glad to see them. This is Jesus' welcoming heart toward people. It's like the heart of the father of the prodigal son. When he took one step to come back, his father ran to meet him and welcomed him with open arms and hugged him and kissed him and gave him sandals and a ring and a robe and even killed the fattened calf for him. This is Jesus. And this same Jesus who welcomed this crowd is now at the right hand of our Father God in heavenly glory and power. And what does he do? He welcomes us to come to him. No matter where we are, he welcomes us. Whether we're in Mexico, Canada, Russia, Ukraine, India, the USA, Jesus welcomes us. Whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, spring, summer, fall, winter, the Middle Ages, or 2016, Jesus welcomes us. Not only so, he takes the initiative and comes after us. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. At this moment, Jesus welcomes each one of us to come to him. Let's come to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And let's learn his welcoming heart toward others. After welcoming them, what did Jesus do? Well, these people had many practical problems. Poverty, hunger, failing health, oppression, and so on. Jesus could have organized a political movement and worked for social reform. He could have entertained people, telling many interesting stories. But he did not. He spoke about the kingdom of God. Well, it seems irrelevant to them. But in fact, that's what they needed most. Though people seem to have many problems, at the root, we all have a common problem. It is bondage to the power of sin and death. And this is manifest in many ways through addictions, personality disorders, family dysfunction, injustices, social deviance, even criminal behavior. And no one can solve this problem. In spite of vast advances in technology and education, the fundamental tragedies of the human condition remain the same today as they were thousands of years ago. But Jesus rescues us from the power of sin and death. Jesus forgives our sins. He unites us with the Father God. He heals our inner wounds and restores the image of God in us. He rules over us through his Holy Spirit with love and joy and peace. And he gives us living hope in the kingdom of God. You know, someday we're all going to leave this world. What then? Without Jesus, there's only God's judgment and eternal condemnation 
in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And Jesus warned us about this in the gospel again and again. It's a reality. But Jesus changes our destiny and welcomes into his kingdom all who trust in him. Jesus gives us living hope in the kingdom of God. So we have real security and everlasting victory. You know you're a victor? Did you know that? In Jesus? You have victory in Jesus. And this is what all people need more than anything else in the world. So this is why Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God to all who came to him. But he also healed the sick and cared practically for people's needs. When we see this passage and see what Jesus was doing, it is clear that he was like a father or a mother to needy people. He had a parent's heart for them. You know, parents love their children unconditionally. When we visit the CBF Easter, Con Easter worship service, wow, parents unconditionally picture their own children. <laughs> Even if their children made many mistakes, wow, my child did so well. Because parents always hope, always love, always encourage, always build up. And when one is sick or one is needy, that one is the one parents care for. Parents never abandon those in need, but love them more and serve them with their life. And this is what Jesus wanted his disciples to do. Well, they came to Jesus. You know, it was getting late. Sun is setting. They had been patient until now. They didn't complain about canceling their retreat. But late in the afternoon, they came to Jesus. You know, Jesus... You're so busy and only ministering to people. I think maybe you kind of forgot what time it is. It's very late. And you know, we have to eat. And they have to eat. And they need a place to stay. So, hey, Jesus, what about this? Why don't you send them away? Yeah? Yeah, yeah let's send them away. They can go find food and lodging and we'll all be happy. Well, Jesus didn't agree. He said to them, you give them something to eat. I think they just about fainted. <laughs> they never imagined Jesus would say this. But what is it that he really wants them to do? He wants them to be understanding of the crowd. They're hungry. They need food. And you should help them. Jesus wants us to know his heart and not send people away, but welcome them and serve them, even cooking a delicious meal. This is the very important as Jesus' disciples, that we have this heart, a parent's heart, to welcome and care for his needy people. How did the disciples respond? Well, 
we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all these people. You want us to go and buy food for all these people? (laughs) The Bible says about 5,000 men were there. If we include women, it's 10,000 or more. And it was a daunting task, and they were a little rebellious toward Jesus. The crowd's too big and too demanding. But Jesus didn't rebuke them. He began to work with them and help them to step out in faith. He said, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. So making the size smaller, manageable, dividing the labor, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. This is not an impossible task. Have them sit down. I'm going to do something. And the disciples did so and everyone sat down. And they began to think, wow, wow, something's going to happen. Jesus is going to do something. And then Jesus took five loaves and two fish. And he looked up to heaven. The disciples looked at the crowd. Jesus looked up to heaven. And he gave thanks to God. And then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. Jesus gave thanks and gave the loaves. Jesus gave. In this way, five loaves and two fish became enough to feed the whole crowd of people. The Bible says they all ate and were satisfied. They even picked up 12 basketfuls of pieces left over. Jesus demonstrated he is almighty God, the provider of human need. And he showed his disciples a parent's heart in caring for people. Does Jesus still work miracles today? Our UBF ministry is an example. He's blessed so many to experience God's kingdom through kingdom workers who learned a parent's heart. I hope we can all share our stories this week of how Jesus worked through us. I would also like to share a very short story that you may not have heard before from the city of Juarez, Mexico. Back in 1972, a Jesuit priest, Father Rick Thomas, was inspired by Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, to give something to people in need. So he organized a group of workers, prepared food for 150 people, and went to a notorious garbage dump where the poorest people lived. When he arrived, he found they were separated into two groups, rival gangs occupying the garbage dump. And the leader of the bigger gang said to him, okay, we're glad you came. First, feed us. If anything's left over, you can feed them. But he said, no. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ and I've come in the name of Christ. And he went to a neutral place and began to distribute the food. Well, they soon realized there was not enough for everybody, but they gave what they had. And hungry people began to eat with thanksgiving. And as they ate and they were satisfied, they began to pull out their instruments, their guitar, some cardboard drums, and they begin to sing and celebrate. And all the division between the two groups began to disappear. Well, strangely, the food supply did not run out. The lady serving the ham kept cutting 
slice after slice, but it didn't run out. She kept cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And still, it's all there. Finally, she asked a young person, man, my arm is getting tired. Would you take over for me? So a young person began to cut the ham. Later, they found there were over 300 people present at that time. All of them ate and were satisfied. And there was even leftovers, so much that they visited three nearby orphanages with lots of leftover food. When one person has a parent's heart and trusts in Jesus, miracles happen. Today we have learned of Jesus' welcoming heart and his parents' heart. Let's pray that we may have this kind of heart and proclaim the kingdom of God in our time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love, welcoming anyone and everyone who comes to you, and for your deep desire to save us from our sins and death and to give us your kingdom. Please help us to know your heart, to simply obey your word, experience your power, and be useful to you as kingdom workers. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.